previous videos, we've looked at how our change in internal energy can be expressed in two forms, heat and work, for a reaction. Now in this example, we're going to look at specifically what we call a bomb calorimeter and why we may use this specific instrument in order to quantify change in internal energy for a reaction when we do this in a bomb calorimeter. So let's do a quick description of what we mean by a bomb calorimeter. Basically, we have this rigid container and inside of that we got water and then we have this other very rigid container in a sealed, what we call a bomb. And the reason why we call it a bomb, uh, we have a constant volume of our reaction. Basically, we're gonna have some reaction occur and we're going to not allow the volume to expand. It's just going to be stuck in this constant volume container. So for a bomb calorimeter, what we'll notice is that our change in volume will always be zero. A reaction does not have the ability to expand, nor does a reaction have the ability to contract. And we think of how that relates back to work. We have defined work as negative P times delta V. And if delta V is zero, that must mean work is zero. A reaction does not have, and again, this is the work of the reaction, the ability to expand or contract, and so therefore work can't be done by or on the reaction. Well, if we bring that back to the fact that we know our change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W, and if W is zero, what we'll notice is that our change in internal energy is equal to the Q of our reaction at constant volume conditions. We also see this as Q sub V to note we're at constant volume. So we notice this is a re uh, reaction condition that we restrict on our reaction. And what that means is that our heat transferred that we measure is equal to our change in internal energy. And that is work cannot be done on or by the reaction. So when, when we're looking at our uh, bomb calorimeters, one important distinction we'll notice is that we're going to be looking at our change in internal energy. And this is why this specific instrument is used, is we can actually quantify the change in internal energy because we don't have any interferences with having to try and measure the expansion of a reaction or contraction of a reaction. So now that we have that kind of a foundation, looking at a bomb calorimeter, let's work through an example of this together. So here we have our example. Uh, this is a bomb calorimeter example. We have 2.85 grams of benzoic acid combusted in a bomb calorimeter. So again, we're using that same bomb calorimeter we just diagrammed out. The temperature of the calorimeter, so again, our calorimeter is that water, the metal, the insulation of the calorimeter, our thermometer. So it's everything about our calorimeter. Uh, it went from 28.45 to 33.79 degrees Celsius. So right off the bat, we notice that the Q of our calorimeter is positive. It gained energy because it increased in temperature. And the Q of our reaction is going to be negative. And that would mean this is an exothermic reaction, right? A reaction that releases heat is an exothermic reaction. We want to identify the heat capacity of the calorimeter in units of kilojoules per degree Celsius. Basically, what we're doing is we are going to calibrate that calorimeter. We need to know how much energy is absorbed or released uh, when it undergoes a temperature change. And the information that we know is that we know the change in internal energy for the combustion of benzoic acid, which is that is the reaction that we're doing here is negative 3,227 kilojoules for every mole. We also know the molar mass of benzoic acid. So those are our kind of tools that we have here. So let's define what we mean by our system and our surroundings, because it's gonna help us define heat transfer. Our system is what we're studying, and so that would be our reaction, and our surroundings is what's just right around that, and what's right around our, our reaction is our calorimeter. So we're gonna look at heat exchange between the reaction and the calorimeter. And we need to answer also, what is causing heat exchange to occur? Why is heat being transferred? And this has to do with the change in potential energy as our reactants and products 
break and form bonds. So we have this change in potential energy as these reaction bonds are being broken and bonds are being formed. Now that net change in potential energy is what causes, in this case, energy to be released because we know it's negative here. How are we going to quantify the heat of the system? So again, let's call that our reaction. Well, again, we're in a bond calorimeter, so we know that the Q of our reaction is equal to our change in internal energy. Now, if we want to make sure we correspond to the fact that relative to the amount that we react, if we reacted one mole of benzoic acid, that would be our Q. But what we're going to do is we're going to add in this other piece of information and say, well, let's scale it to the actual number of moles of our reactant, which in this case would be our benzoic acid. Then we say how we're going to quantify the heat of our surroundings. Well, we already know that we're trying to find the Q of our, our, our heat capacity. So we're probably going to want to use the Q of our calorimeter is heat capacity of our calorimeter times the change in temperature the calorimeter undergoes. Now I'm going to take a quick side step. Number one, we look here and we see our reaction is not undergoing a change in temperature. Our reaction is undergoing a change in potential energy. So that's why we don't use Q equals C delta T for our reaction, or we don't use Q equals MCS delta T. Right? We don't use either one of those because our reaction is not undergoing a temperature change. Our reaction is breaking bonds in our reactants and forming bonds in our products, causing a change in potential energy. Then we go to our surroundings, the calorimeter. A calorimeter is not reacting, right? It's, it's not undergoing a change. We still have water, we still have metal, we still have the insulator, we still have the thermometer. All we see here is that it's undergoing a temperature change. So it makes sense for us to utilize that expression there. So now that we have those kind of groundworks uh, established for us, let's go ahead and think about how are we gonna look at the amount of heat released or absorbed by our reaction and how that corresponds to our calorimeter. So I like to always start with this idea of heat transfer. So we're gonna start with the Q of our calorimeter is equal and opposite to the Q of our reaction. And then we're gonna use what we just identified in saying, well, the Q of our calorimeter, we just quantified as the heat capacity of our calorimeter times the change in temperature of our calorimeter. And then we go to our reaction, we just said we're gonna quantify the Q of our reaction by the change in internal energy times the number of moles that we would have. We'll also see that we could also use uh, our change in internal energy as a conversion factor from mass and then moles of benzoic acid to Q. So we'll see, we can use both of those and we'll talk how we can express that. So now we have this relationship and we see, okay, which of these, do we have enough information to quantify either one of these? Well, we don't know what our bomb calorimeter heat capacity is. That's our goal. So that must mean we have to know all the information about our reaction to quantify the Q of the reaction. Well, we do know the delta E and we know the mass, which can get us to the number of moles. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna bring this over here. Q of our reaction is equal to our mass that we have here, 2.85 grams, and I'm gonna use BA for benzoic acid. Well, before I can even use that my delta E is negative 3,227 kilojoules per mole of benzoic acid, I gotta first convert this to moles. So one mole of benzoic acid for every 122.12 grams of benzoic acid. So now I notice if I stop here, it gives me moles of benzoic acid, but I want to get to heat or energy, or in this case, kilojoules. So I'm going to see, I'm going to use this and convert between the amount of benzoic acid to the amount of heat released. So I know for every one mole of benzoic acid, I'm going to use here, this is again our delta E because we're at constant volume, negative 3,227 kilojoules will be released for every one mole. Well, we don't have one mole, we have much less than that because we don't have two, two, uh, 122 grams, we only have 2.85 grams. And so what we'll find is that we would actually release 75.3 kilojoules, and that is the Q of our reaction. That's the amount of heat that was released by our reaction. Okay, so now we, we've identified that, so let's kind of move backwards now. 
Now we know the Q of our reaction. We can use that to find the Q of our calorimeter. So now we know the Q of our calorimeter is the opposite of the Q of our reaction because they're equal and opposite, same magnitude, opposite sign. So it's going to be negative, negative 75.3 kilojoules, or the Q of our calorimeter is positive, 75.3 kilojoules, which makes sense what we originally observed when we said it's going to gain energy because it's increasing in temperature. Well, now we go back and we notice, well, if I have identified the Q of my calorimeter, and I know the temperature change that the calorimeter underwent, I can then quantify our heat capacity. So if we kind of track the fact that we know our calorimeter, we know our delta T, let's go ahead and bring that down and solve that here. So the Q of our calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity of our calorimeter times our delta T. Let's fill in the information we know. 75.3 kilojoules is equal to our heat capacity times our temperature change. So we ended at 33.79 degrees Celsius. We started at 28.45 degrees Celsius, and so we go ahead and solve for our heat capacity, 14.1 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So every degree Celsius that our heat, our uh, calorimeter increases, it's going to absorb that much energy in kilojoules, 14.1 kilojoules. So now what we know that we have some information about our calorimeter. We know its heat capacity. And we see that there's this connection between what we knew about the change in internal energy. So we knew the change in internal energy for this reaction is going to release that much energy for every mole. And we use that going back to the first law of thermodynamics to look at heat transfer here. Now what I want us to do is go ahead and apply this to a new reaction. So I'm going to give you a chance to pause and practice. <coughs> What I'd like for you to do, let's talk through this question and I'll give you a chance to work on it. 2.3 grams of sucrose was combusted in the same bomb calorimeter. And so that would mean it's the same heat capacity we just identified. The temperature rose from 21.28 to 23.97 degrees Celsius. Again, that's for our calorimeter. What is the change in internal energy for one mole of sucrose reacting? And so we know the molar mass of sucrose. Why don't you go ahead and pause and answer this question on your own and then come back and see how I work through it. Well, now that you had a chance to work on it, hopefully you talk through and thought through some of these questions on your own. <clears throat> As we're thinking about what is the system, our reaction, what is the surroundings, our calorimeter, it's right around our reaction, what's causing heat to be exchanged, the change of potential energy as we go from reactants to products. How will the heat of the reaction, or the system, which is our reaction, be quantified? Again, our reaction does not undergo a temperature change. Our reaction is undergoing a change of potential energy. So the Q of our reaction is going to be equal to the change in internal energy times the number of moles of reactant that we'd have. In this case, the number of moles of sucrose. How will the heat of surroundings be quantified? The Q of our surroundings is our calorimeter, and that would be equal to our heat capacity of our calorimeter times the change in temperature that it undergoes. Now again, as we do this, hopefully we thought through this idea of heat transfer. So the Q of our calorimeter is equal and opposite to the Q of our reaction. And again, very similar to what we just did before, we think about the Q of our calorimeter is the heat capacity of our calorimeter times the change in temperature the calorimeter undergoes. And the Q of our reaction, again, undergoing a change in internal energy, and then we're going to scale that to the amount of sucrose that actually reacted. Well, in this case, our goal is to identify the change in internal energy. We don't know that. However, what we do know, if we think through the information over here, we know our heat capacity, and we know our change in temperature. So let's go ahead and calculate the Q of our calorimeter. How much heat was gained by our calorimeter? 14.1 kilojoules per degree Celsius. We just calculated that in the previous example, and we did that because we know that this is the same bottom calorimeter, so it's going to have the same heat capacity. 23.97 degrees Celsius. We, start, we ended at, started at 21.28 degrees Celsius, and we would find the Q of our calorimeter 37.9 
kilojoules. Well, we track that back and we realize that would mean the Q of R reaction is equal and opposite. So the Q of R reaction is negative 37.9 kilojoules. Again, another exothermic reaction. We're releasing heat when this reaction is occurring. Well, that would be equal to the delta E for however much we reacted, 2.3 grams of sucrose. But we want to figure out, well, how many, uh, what would be the delta E, not for 2.3 grams, but for one mole? And so we use this expression here. We can go ahead and rearrange that. And we could say, we're looking at rearranging this. We're going to bring our sucrose over here. The delta E, and I'm going to go ahead and say just per mole, to remind us is going to be per mole, is going to be equal to the Q of our reaction divided by the number of moles, in this case, of sucrose for reacted. So that would be our negative 37.9 kilojoules divided by the number of moles of sucrose, 0 0.00671 moles, and we found that from our mass and our molar mass. And so we would find that our delta E is going to be negative 5,640 kilojoules per mole of sucrose. And again, what we're doing is we're normalizing it to a mole of sucrose so that way we can make sure we can kind of correspond it back to our original reaction. And again, we always start with our idea of heat transfer, stepping into how do we quantify that heat, and then we see what variables we know and move forward from there. So hopefully this gave us a chance to see some of the experiments that we can use when we're looking at bomb calorimeters. In our next video, we're going to look at coffee cup calorimeters and how we have the ability to look at quantifying heat uh, with those types of instruments.